Well, today we are going to have a teaching entitled Knowing God. Show me your glory. This uh, teaching has kind of come about over, over several years. One day I was uh, reading through uh, Psalms and I came across uh, Psalm 89 um, and verse 14 in particular. We'll be looking at that a little bit later. And I read that and I thought, wow. And I started looking up some of the words and, and it's like the more I read it, it's like, wow, this is amazing. And, uh, and then that led me to another verse and then I began to do some more study. And, and anyway, just the... Uh, the, the this well realizing about who God is, our Father, about who He is, and how He wants to have a personal relationship with us. He is an amazing God. I want to start though today with a with a story that kind of uh, illustrates some of the things I want to talk about has to do with my dad. Um, you know, I grew up with my dad, so, I mean, I spent time with him, obviously. I was with him, you know, every day. We went on vacations together. We did all this stuff. But then, um, when he got into his uh, 80s, well, I guess it was before that. I guess when he got into his 70s, he decided that he wanted to write an autobiography about his life showing how blessed of a person, how blessed of a man he was by God. And he, so he put together this uh, biography, and basically what it is is snapshots of people and events that, that changed uh, the course of his life. And so there's all kinds of stories in there and that kind of thing. And the one I wanted to relate today was about... Uh, about him, he was growing up. Uh, his <coughs> his actual full name is Bird Lamar Dyer, and his family, uh, the, the name Bird. I don't need to go into that, but it it came from uh, some incidences uh, in his life and in, in his uh, lineage. But Lamar was the name that his uh, parents. His siblings, aunts, and uncles, everybody called him Lamar. So he grew up Lamar. So, uh, you know, all the kids in school, everything. He hated that name. That was the last name he would have chosen for himself, is Lamar. And he despised it. But he had a unique opportunity in his life <coughs> when he joined the service. And, uh, when, uh, when they were assigning uh, uniforms and fatigues and all that kind of stuff, they give you the option of putting a, a nickname on your uniform. So he said, I'm Chuck and Lamar, and he decided on Buzz. So from that day on, everybody uh, knew in his life, knew him as Buzz. No more Lamar. And so he changed his name, and I'm sure over the course of time changed people's perception of him. And I, I share that because God kind of did some of the same kind of things. If you read through the scripture, and if you understand, especially in the King James, about uh, some of the, the names of God, in particular the way that it's written in the King James, you'll find God, you know, capital G, little O, little D. You'll find Lord, capital L, small O, small R, small D, and then sometimes you'll see Lord all in capitals. Um, that all had to do with the names of God, as God was revealing himself to mankind. Um, and then, of course, you know, there's... Uh, you know, El Shaddai and, and uh, El Elyon and, and all these different names that he 
revealed himself in. So we want to look today at some ways that God revealed himself. Now, when I was in uh, Bible college, I took a course called The Attributes of God. And in that course, the book was about that thick, about three inches thick. The Attributes of God. Systematic theology, all the different attributes of God and the, all the scriptures that related to it and that kind of thing. Well, that's not what I really want to talk about today. Not those kind of, you know, God is omnipresent and omniscient and om, om, uh, omni-whatever. Uh, he is our God. And more than that, he is our Father. So today, what we want to look at are attributes, are, well, really what I want to look at today is the heart of God. How he affects us personally. How knowing him changes the way that we think about God and our response to him. Today, I want to help change your life. Today I want to help change your prayer life. Today I want to help you to find victory over the challenges of your life more easily. In looking at the overview, Daniel 11 verse 32 says, but the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. The people that know their God, we're not talking about just knowing about God, we're talking about knowing God. The people that know their God shall be strong. Why? Because they know who their God is, and they shall be strong. And because they are strong and they know their God, they shall do Exploits. They shall do. In the uh, King James, the word exploits is italicized, which means it's not really there. And it's just, they shall be strong and do. They shall perform. They shall work. And yes, they shall do exploits because they know their God. And again, we are not talking about knowing about God. You can take that systematic theology class on the attributes of God and you can know all about God. You can memorize all the scriptures but what I want us to know to understand today is that it is about knowing him as your intimate father. Because when you know your Abba when you know your Abba Daddy in that way you develop a deep trust in him Because you know who he is, you know his ways, his character, and his love. And because you know those things about him, which we're going to be talking about today, because you know who he is, you understand his heart, you understand his direction, you understand his love, and his faithfulness, and his righteousness, and his his ways because you understand him, then you can respond to him appropriately. The word says that my people, God's people, perish for the lack of knowledge. Now, it's more than just knowledge. It's the right knowledge. There's a lot of things out there about God. A lot of things you can find about uh, about God that are wrong. And if that is your knowledge of God, then you're going to respond inappropriately. I want us today to know the heart of the Father. So like that song that we sang, I want to sit at your feet 
drink from the cup in your hand. Lay back against you and breathe. Feel your heart beat. This love is so deep. It's more than I can stand. I melt in your peace. It's overwhelmed me. <clears throat> As you interface with God, as you speak to Him, as you spend time with Him and get to know Him, then you will know, well, in this situation, what do I do? Well, you know God's heart. You know God's thinking about things. Because he's revealed it in his word and he's revealed it to you as you have spent time with him. You build that knowledge of God by spending time with him. By spending time in his word as he's revealed it. Let's talk first about know his ways. This is kind of a, an overview introduction to the details. So we're just going to kind of look at this. This is like a big picture uh, way of looking at it. In Psalm 103, verse 7, this is said, He, talking about God, made known His ways to Moses and His acts to the children of Israel. So God made known his ways. That means his method of operation. His, his road is what it talks about in the Hebrew. His, his way of doing things. So he made known to Moses his ways. But to the children of Israel his acts. The children of Israel saw the things that he did. They saw the plagues that happened. They saw the pillar of fire by night and the pillar of smoke of cloud by day they saw the red sea open they saw all these miracles they saw the food being provided so they knew his acts they knew what he could do but Moses knew his ways understood what he was like if you read through Exodus starting in Exodus chapter 3 when God introduced himself to Moses with the burning bush. What was the first thing that God said when Moses turned aside? He said, I am the God of your father Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Take off your shoes for the place that you are standing is holy ground. That was that was Moses' first introduction to God. This is holy ground. This is sacred ground set apart. And as you read through Exodus, you should do that sometime. Look, look, read through Exodus, starting there in, in chapter 3. Read through Exodus and look at every place where Moses and God interact. Of course, he goes on there from chapter 3 and he starts telling him about, I'm going to, you know, I've chosen you to deliver my people. And he says, Well, who am I going to tell him sent me? He said, Tell him the I am. You know, in the Hebrew, that is the word to be. So it was showing that he is the, uh, the one without beginning, without end. He just is the self existent one. I am that I am. And so as God was revealing himself to Moses and all through the ten plagues, uh, God talked to him before each plague, God, God talked to him after each plague, and, and just back and forth they, they talked, they talked, they talked, they interacted. And then of course the whole Red Sea incident and, and all that that happened. And then... <clears throat> 
not too long after they had come out of of uh, of uh, Egypt and were in the wilderness there, um, not the wilderness, but in the wilderness after right after the Red Sea, and went to Mount Horeb where God wanted to introduce Himself to the people, and they didn't want to have any part of it. The people were afraid. They said, Moses, you talk to God, you talk to God, and then you tell us what he said. So it was at that time then that Moses went up into the mountain, um, and there he received the Ten Commandments. He uh, t was there for 40 days, fasting, talking to God. And, and then in the middle of that, or I guess towards the end of that 40 days, God spoke to him and said, get thee down now. For your people have uh, defiled themselves. And so Moses made haste, started down the mountain. And that was the whole thing with the golden calf and, the, and that incident. And God said, that's it, I'm done. I'm going to wipe these people out. I'm going to start a new one with you. And Moses pleaded with him for the people. Now why did he do that? Because he had grown intimate with God. He began to understand who he was. But it was in that exchange as God finally said, okay, okay, I'll go with you. Because at first he wanted to just send an angel. He said, okay, I won't wipe him out, but I'm just going to send an angel to go before you. And Moses said, eh, that's not happening. Either you go or we're not going at all. And so in that interaction then, uh, this is what Moses said, Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. So we could already see here that he had a desire to know God, to know his ways. So God began to reveal his ways. And we'll look at some more detail from uh, uh, Exodus 33, which I just read from, and also Exodus 34. But let's talk about it a little bit more general, first of all. In Isaiah 55, verses 7 through 9, we find this. Let the wicked forsake his way. The wicked, those who aren't walking after God's way, forsake his way. And the unrighteous man forsake his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts, God's talking here, for his, God's thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Well, how do we get to know the ways and the thoughts of God? We've got to spend time with him. We've got to spend time in his word. <clears throat> Psalm 97, verse 2. This is one of the verses that just really got me focused on finding out more about who God was as a person. Psalm 97 verse 2. Clouds and darkness are around about him. Righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne. And that word in the Hebrew, the word habitation, could also be translated the foundation. So this here, I thought, wow, look at this. The foundation of his throne what makes God tick? What is the baseline of who God is? Righteousness and judgment. Righteousness being doing things in the right way. Doing what is right. And judgment is the, the legal proclamation that this is right or this is wrong. So righteousness is what is right. Judgment is the difference between the right and the wrong. The proclamation of righteousness, the proclamation of 
damnation. So righteousness and judgment are the foundation of his throne. We see it also in Isaiah 6 verses 1 through 3. In the year that King Uzziah died. And I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. High and lifted up. And his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face. With twain he covered his feet. And with twain he did fly. <clears throat> and one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So notice there that when the, the seraphim are proclaiming what they see about God, Proclaiming his attributes. What is coming out of their mouth? Holy, holy, holy. There that is. Righteousness and judgment. Holy is the Lord. We see the same similar scene in Revelation chapter 4. The four beasts. Again, all with six wings. With eyes around about and what do they do with those eyes they're looking they're flying around they're looking at God they're they're looking for the attributes of God and what do they say holy 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 Lord God almighty so that is God's the basis the bottom line of who God is he is holy he is righteous <clears throat> but then look from God's righteousness flows his mercy, his goodness, his grace, and his love. Psalm 89 verse 14. Here's that verse that I found. <clears throat> it says, Justice, that's the same exact word as righteousness in Psalm 97. Justice and judgment are the habitation. There it is again. The foundation of thy throne. And then look at this. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. <clears throat> so from from the throne of righteousness then from his face flows mercy and truth. And that, those mercy and truth could also be translated his mercy, his goodness, his grace, his love, his loving kindness. So the basis for his love is his holiness, is his righteousness. So you know that in his love for you, he will only do what is right. He will only do what is holy. <clears throat> we see that revealed also in Exodus, which I was reading a few minutes ago, part of that in Exodus 33. <clears throat> in God's glory, we see his goodness, mercy, grace, and righteousness. See, God's glory is his expression of himself. What is, what is he saying about himself? His glory. Exodus 33. Verse 18. Now this of course was after he had that exchange. That God finally said. Okay. I'm going to go with you. And into the promised land. And, and be with you. And, and then Moses response was, I beseech thee, show me your glory. Show me what makes you, you. And the Lord said, God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will show mercy on whom I show mercy. And then Exodus, in Exodus 34 we see the, 
the actual process of how that happened. He's in chapter 33, he was saying, I'm going to do this. I'm going to show you. I'll make all my goodness. Now in chapter 34, starting in verse 5, now he is doing that. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. <clears throat> so now this is his name. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God. Now the capitals there of Lord, that is referring to uh, uh, Yahweh, or also known as Jehovah. For the Lord God, Jehovah El, merciful and gracious and long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, <clears throat> forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. So here we see the, from his righteousness and his judgment, we see the goodness of God flowing forth from his face. And, and then he goes on, and that <clears throat> will by no means clear the guilty. Now we see his judgment, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. And then look at Moses' response. <clears throat> and Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. Moses had gotten a glimpse, a better glimpse, a better insight into who God is. And it says, and he bowed his head towards the earth and worshipped. And that needs to be our response also. So what I want us to do now, that's kind of the, the overview of understanding his ways. In other words, what is God about? He is about righteousness, judgment. That is the foundation of his throne. So we can trust God that he will only do and only bring about for our lives righteousness. But also judgment. He also from his righteousness and his judgment from his face flows mercy and loving kindness and grace. These are the things that make God who he is. And so by understanding these things, we can then trust that he will do what is right. He will do what is loving. He will do what is good for our lives. Now, I'm talking here, of course, uh, so far, just talking about God the Father. But let me mention that it also applies equally to Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Because somewhere I heard the word Trinity. They're all, they're all one. Matter of fact, in, and when I say that, they're all one, means that they, they are all God. Three different parts, but all God. Jesus, in John 14 when he's uh, talking, uh, Philip says, Jesus, show us the Father, and then we will be satisfied. And Jesus said to him, Have I not been with you so long? Do you not realize that when you have seen me, you have seen the Father? And also in John 14 and John 16, we see the Holy Spirit being said of that he will only do the things that he sees Jesus doing. He'll only say the things that he hears Jesus saying. So the Holy Spirit, again, is just a, 
uh, part of the Godhead is only going to be in alignment with the Father and with the Son. So as we spend time with, with God, you know, we don't want to leave out Jesus. We don't want to leave out the Holy Spirit. We want to have fellowship with the Trinity and understanding what they have done, who they are like, what they do, uh, helps us in our lives. So let's go on now to page two, to know, know his righteousness. God will always act righteously. Number one there, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness from Matthew 6.33. To seek there means to search as for something hidden. So seeking the kingdom and seeking God's righteousness is not going to be something that just appears. We have to seek for it as for seeking for something hidden. We have to search the scriptures. We have to pray. We have to ask God. We have to uh, allow him to show himself to us. scripture says and we're going to look at that in a few minutes that God is light and in him is no darkness and if we say that we walk in the light but we walk in darkness we lie and the truth is not in us but he who walks in the light as he is in the light see that's what we want to to be like the more that we walk in the light then we begin to understand his light which is righteousness the more that we walk in love God is love he who dwells in God dwells in love the scripture tells us so if we dwell in in love we're going to be dwelling in God and these are things that will be that he'll, he'll reveal himself even more and more to us as we walk in it <clears throat> as we are good as we exemplify goodness to those around us and grace and mercy you know people are people and that means people are going to do things. People are going to say things. People are going to, to hurt us in some ways. People are going to do things unexpectedly that we may not like. But people are people. But our response is goodness. Our response is forgiveness and love and mercy and grace. So the more that we walk in these things, the more that we begin to understand even more about who God is and about his working in our life. When a challenge comes to our life and we're faced with a dilemma, we're faced with things that, you know, in our body, we're faced with things in our finances, we're faced with challenges in relationships with others. And we come before God and we, we're gonna, we want to pray about it. We want to ask God. Well, see, if you already have an understanding of who God is and how God acts and how God works, then you have a better understanding then of what your response is in that situation should be what God would have you to do because you know that he's righteous that he's loving that he is uh, full of goodness he is faithful and of course he is powerful one thing to realize in trials and temptations and tests that we uh, encounter in our lives 
for one thing, it says in uh, James chapter 1, verse 2, let us count it all joy when we encounter these temptations, trials, tests, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And when we let patience, in other words, we stay in the trial and let God teach us and minister to us and deliver us from that trial, then it says that patient, let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect um, and complete, lacking nothing. But in verse 13, he says, let no man say when he is tempted, and again that's the same word, tempted, taught, tried, tested, that he is tempted, tried, or tested of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and neither tempteth he any man. That will solve a lot of your problems right there. Realizing that whatever this trial is, it is not of God. It is not God trying to bring something on you. It's not God trying to teach you things. It is an attack of the evil one against the promises of God. The evil one's trying to get you to sin in some form or fashion through, each, through those temptations, tri trials, and tests. Our response is to say, no, we're going to stay in patience. We're going to stay in faith. And we shall see God deliver us. When we know it's not God doing it, <laughs> that may sound funny, but when we know that it's not God doing it, then that gives us the impetus. So wait a second. If it's not God, then I have the word. I have the Holy Spirit. I have the words of my mouth. I can speak against this thing. I can come against it. I know what, what, uh, what the word says about in these incidences. And we can then overcome. Another important thing that comes out of his righteousness is that it is impossible for God to lie. From Hebrews 6.18. That by two Im immutable things, and if you read the context there from 12 down to verse 18, those two immutable things are God's promise and God's oath. And by these two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. So when you're being tried and tempted and tested, what is it that God has said in his word about those things? You have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. My God shall supply all your needs according to your riches and glory. These are promises of God. These are things, statements made by God. It is a promise. It is an oath sealed by Jesus and what Jesus did on the cross. Therefore, because of that, it is impossible for God to lie. And so when we have those challenges in our life, we can say, wait a second. I know what God has said. This doesn't come from him. And it's impossible for him to lie so I can stand on his word. And I know for me, that was such a turning point in a challenge that I went through many years ago, was knowing that it was impossible for God to lie. And I knew at that point, it was over. It was over. I could take it to the bank. Now, it was another, I don't know, six or seven months before I saw the full manifestation. But I knew at that point, it was settled. And when we have that, it is a strong consolation. In other words, it's a strong encouragement to our heart and our soul that it is impossible for God to lie. We've already talked about God is light and walking in the light. Pretty much quoted those scriptures so we can, we can go on from there. We need to know his goodness. God will always be good. Um, there, there's a, it was a saying that went around a long time ago. Someone would say, God is good. And the other person would say, all the time. Then the other person would say, and all the time. And they go back to the other one, God is good. And, uh, and so that is a truism that is always true. God is will always be good. 
because his goodness reveals his mercy and his grace. And we saw that already in in Exodus 33. And he said, I will make my goodness pass before you and proclaim the name of the Lord. I'll be gracious to whom I'll be gracious and show mercy on whom I will show mercy. So his mercy and his grace is revealed in his goodness. God is abundant in goodness. We saw that in Exodus 34. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant, abundant in goodness and truth. Uh, Other scriptures, uh, Psalm 31, how great is thy goodness which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee, uh, which hath wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons of men. The earth is full of the goodness of God. We read that earlier in the opening. Lord loveth righteousness and judgment. Here we see those same two, two things. The Lord loves those things. So they are not just the foundation of his throne, but he loves them. He loves righteousness and judgment. The earth is full of the goodness of God. And of course we know from Romans chapter 2 verse 4 that the goodness of God leads men to repentance. And it should lead us to repentance also. Because we see his goodness, we know his goodness, we should want to be obedient to him. We should want to be in walking in the light with him. It leads us to repent and turn from our wicked way as we saw in Isaiah 55 so that we know his ways and his thoughts. In uh, James chapter 1, verse 17, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights, in whom there is no shadow of turning or variance. Wow, that is amazing. And of course, you know, that actually is in James 17, which follows James 13. So, we don't, we know that God doesn't tempt us because he tempts no man but we also know that every good and perfect gift comes down from the father of lights we need to know his love he is love and therefore he never fails from Psalm 89 verse 14 from his face flows mercy and loving kindness justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne mercy and truth shall go before thy face and we that word mercy there could also be translated loving kindness and yeah loving kindness Ephesians chapter 3, starting in verse 17, that Christ, the anointed one and his anointing, may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love. For us, this is a very important understanding about God and his love. And the importance of us being rooted and grounded in his love. And that's what this uh, passage, we'll we'll go on here in a minute. That's what it's talking about. But being rooted and grounded in love. Penny and I have uh, been working real hard on growing our garden. And we are excited to see how it is uh, more and more flourishing. And... One of the things you realize when you're gardening is how important it is for the roots to be grounded. If you have too shallow of a soil and the roots go down and they can't really find anywhere to go, in other words, you don't you don't grow a big old tomato plant, you know, in a four inch uh, little pot. Now it may come from Home Depot in that four inch pot. But that doesn't mean that you just let it grow in that pot. 
because it becomes root bound. For us, <laughs> his love for us is, I'm going to, it's, it's undefined. It is so deep, it is so rich, it is so full that it's almost without definition. We'll see that in a moment. And so we never will reach the bottom of his love. And when we are rooted and our roots go down deep, the house that we live in, there was a huge tree in the front yard. Some of you who have been over there might remember that huge tree that was in our front yard. Well, the problem with that particular tree was that it did not send down deep roots. And what would happen is the roots would start growing along the, you know, sometimes outside of the ground or just under the ground. And it just spread and spread. And finally the neighbor next door said, your roots are ruining my uh, irrigation system. And so anyway, uh, it ended up, the tree ended up being cut down because it wasn't rooted. Now, the, also the problem with that is not being rooted is that a, a, a big wind uh, could have easily uh, toppled that tree because it had no depth of root. And so we want to be so rooted and grounded in his love, of knowing his love, that nothing, no storm of life. I'm thinking now of Matthew chapter 7 about having our foundation, on our, our house built on the foundation of the word of God. So when our roots are down deep and the storms of life come and beat against our lives, we hold because our roots are down deep in his love. Going on to verse 18. That you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. And I'll just go ahead and read out the, the end of this verse there. That ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. We are to, I, I, in my mind, this takes me back to seeking God, seeking the kingdom of God, of which this is part of, and his righteousness, his way of doing things, which also is love. That you might know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. That's where I get that it's almost undefinable, because it is so deep. We, we, See what we see of, of his love, but his love is much greater than that. I like to say this. His love is like the ocean. Matter of fact, there's a song that says that, isn't there? <laughs> From the scripture. And anyway, and what we do is we dip in our cup and we pull out a little bit of love. And we say, Wow, the love of God is amazing out of our little cup. But his love is so much bigger and greater than that. So we, when we know his love, we can trust it. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Matter of fact, <laughs> isn't that amazing? First John chapter 4. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And the expression of that was he sent his son to be the propitiation, the satisfaction for our sin. Not just the sins that we've created, or that we did in the past and we're now forgiven of those sins, but the things that we ch are challenged with in our life, the propitiation, he's the satisfaction of our sins. And then going on, uh, there in chapter 4, starting in verse 16. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. So those are some 
ways of knowing his love. We have known and believed. We need to understand the best we can with our little handful or little cupful of the love of Jesus, of the love of God. We have known it and then we believe it. We trust in that love. God is love. He that dwells in love dwells in God and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect. So our love is made perfect as we know and believe the love of God, as we uh, dwell in love, dwelling in God, then that is love. That's how love is made perfect. And the result of that is that on the day that we meet our Lord and Savior, we have boldness because we know that we, his love has forgiven us of everything. We have boldness before him in the day of judgment. Exciting words of love. But look at what else it does. Verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear has torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. Loved us. There is no fear in love. So if you're in your prayer closet, if you're dealing with issues in life and you're finding fear, what's going to happen if this, if this challenge in my body, I mean, it, it could do this and it, it could be that and then, then this and no. That is fear not trusting in the love of God or our finances. Oh no, what's going to happen? This could happen and that could happen. I could be in bankruptcy. Oh no, fear. No, we love. We are rooted and grounded in his love. We need to know his faithfulness. God is always faithful. God is faithful. Psalm 89, verses 1 through 3. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known his faithfulness to all generations. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shall thou establish in the very heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant. He, God, is faithful. He is a faithful God. Deuteronomy 7, 9. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. If you love the Lord your God, and if you um, are keeping his word as the best you can, know that he keeps covenant. He is faithful. Thank you, Jesus. Great is thy faithfulness from Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. Um, it is of the mercy of God that we are not consumed because his compassion fails not. Verse 23, they are new every morning. Amen. Great is thy faithfulness. And from that, based on that, Hebrews 13 verse 5, let your conversation be without covetousness, your lifestyle be without covetousness. And be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And most of us have heard that in the Greek it could be expounded like this. I will never, ever, under any circumstance, leave you nor forsake you. So it is a strong word. He is faithful. And then lastly, we know his power from Psalm 89 verse 13 thou hast a mighty 
arm. Strong is thy hand, and high is thy right hand. So he is a he is a God of strength. And the way that's been revealed to us here in the uh, the New Covenant, we see it in, in uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power? So his power is directed to us on, on our behalf. And in Colossians 1.11, we are strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. So his power through Jesus Christ is available to us. Because we use that power and our authority in the name of Jesus to speak out the things that we are looking for, the things that we are expecting. So just to sum up here real quick, we're talking about our father and about who he is as our intimate father we're not looking to know about God we are looking to know God so that no matter what circumstances no matter what challenges come into our life when we are in our prayer closet with our daddy say God I know that you are righteous. I know that you are love. I know that you are the healer in this situation. And so, Father, I am trusting you. I am depending on you. I am standing on your word. Your word says that I have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. Your word says that you supply all my needs according to your riches and glory. And I know that you are faithful. I know that you, it is impossible for you to lie. So Father, I have my faith in you. I'm standing on you as my Father. And I thank you, Father, that you are bringing to pass what I need in my life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. He is our Abba Daddy. He is our loving Father, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Pastor Matthew. Our God is an awesome God. We are so blessed to be his children and just appreciate all that he is for us and to us. But we do love him dearly and we love him because he first loved us. He set that example. And Jesus set the example with offering his body and his blood to us on an ongoing basis. So let's prepare for partaking of communion together. Get our elements together and let's be sure to make sure that we ourselves, each one of us is in a place of purity, of holiness, to partake of holy communion. So let's confess any sins known or we do the unknown sin prayer. We'll be right back and then we'll begin. Father, we thank you that on that night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it, he said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. What is it that we're to remember? That Jesus took the 39 stripes for us, paying the price for every sickness, every infirmity, every disease, every pain. Jesus paid for it all already. And the benefits of healing and health and wholeness and restoration and rejuvenation belong to us. So now as we go through this process of the great exchange here 
of covenant. Let's partake of the broken body of Jesus to receive in full manifestation the healing and the wholeness that we need for our bodies. Every part of it, every one. If there's more than one challenge, Jesus paid the price for all of them. So our bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit of God. And Father, in the name of Jesus, we receive full manifestation for total healing, restoration, and wholeness in Jesus' precious name. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you as we now partake together. And in the same manner, after the supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you for remission from sins. That was really a mouthful. And the disciples probably didn't understand the fullness of what he was saying, but we can look back and know that Jesus began a new and better way. That no more were there need, was there a need for annual sacrifices because Jesus was the once for all sacrifice. He was the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world, giving up his life, shedding his blood for us, paying the price for every sin. And if the sins are paid for, then there's no wage of sin. And there are covenants with promises sealed with the blood of Jesus. And Jesus made his body and his blood available to us each and every day on an ongoing basis. As often as we choose to partake, we receive of the blessings of his sacrifice anew. We infuse our bodies with the life, the health, the strength, the wisdom, everything that he is. And now as we partake of the blood of Jesus, for the life is in the blood, we thank you, Lord, that we are flooded with the blood of Jesus and saturated with the life of God Almighty. We receive. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's partake together in Jesus' name. 